Good morning. Good morning. Another beautiful day. Um, I've got an ask the pastor question that I'm going to address, but I want to share with you uh, something that happened earlier this week. Um, Christy Thaddeus and I were sitting in the living room, and we were talking, as we are wont to do. And Thaddeus, you know, with the, the ponderings of a teenage mind, he was wondering why some men are more hairy than others. <laughs> well, Dad, why do you suppose, he gave an example, and, and said, you know, they, he has, like, no hair on his legs. I, I, I don't really know. It's genetics, I guess. And Christy came up with what she thought was a very appropriate solution. She said, I think it has to do with blood flow. So those that don't have a lot of hair are lacking blood flow. I said, say what? I said, I think they're, you know, they don't just have enough blood flow to the area. I said, no, I don't think you understand me. Say what? So now you guys know that I'm, I'm operating on reduced blood flow to my noggin. Thank you, love of my life. It's all so clear. Um, last night we watched the movie, the premiere, uh, the Faith Keepers movie. If you were not here, you missed it. Um, it was challenging. It was in some places gut-wrenching. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, for those of you that were here for the movie last night, I'll give you a chance to explain or, or describe what it meant to you, how you felt. But I want to I want to talk touch this uh, ask the pastor question. Um, the question is: Jesus is to have come from the lineage of David. But that is Joseph, which is not Jesus' father. So I am confused. Please explain how this works. So let me, let me back up a little bit. Um, the Jews accounted their lineage through their father. The Jews were very strict on keeping track of your lineage because there were certain conditions that needed to be met for you to be able to worship in the temple. Uh, if you were of the line of Levi, you were a priest, and you had to prove that you were of the line of Levi in order to serve as a priest. If you were uh, of one of the other tribes, um, you were able to come in so far into the tabernacle, into the temple, to worship. But if you were not, or you could not prove your lineage, then you could only come out to the Gentiles' court. Now this is significant because when the Jews left Israel and, and they went into exile with Babylon, the, the uh, northern tribes went earlier with the Assyrians, what's called the Diaspora, and then Judah and Benjamin uh, left under the Babylonians. When they came back, there were three sets of people, okay? And, and you'll see why this is significant in a moment. First, there were the Jews that, that had their lineage and they came back and they basically were restored right to the place where they left. Now they had to clean it up, they had to build the walls, they had to, to, to get back into place, they had to prove ownership of, of the land that was theirs. Um, but, but they had their lineage intact. Okay? So they could take it to the priest, the priest could look at it and say, yeah, you're right. Alright? But then there were those that came back from the exile that could not prove their lineage. They had lost it. Okay. Now keep in mind, the, the, the record books were kept at the temple. And it was important to know where you fit in the scheme of things. But when the temple was destroyed, those, those records were lost. So people would have family records that, that they could come and kind of rebuild. But if you didn't have your family records, you had no way of proving where you fit. And so those people lost the privilege of coming in to worship. They had to stay outside. So that's two classes of people. Those are the ones that are returning. But there's a third class of people. 
When the Babylonians took the Jews out, they left the poorest Jews there in Israel. And then they imported people from other lands that they had conquered to fill out the land so that they could work it, they could till it, and they could make that land profitable for the Babylonians. Okay? Now, one of the rules that, that the Jews had that God put into place was that they were not to intermarry with other people. God wanted a people pure unto himself. Now, does that mean that God despised the other people? No, because if he despised the other people, Jesus would have never come for us. He was setting for himself a people through whom he could bless the world. Okay, And he gave them a, a lot of strict commandments to typify that purity. Okay, Wearing clothes not made of two different types of, of uh, material. Not sowing two types of crop in the same field. Uh, things like that. Okay, The people that were left behind intermarried with these other nationalities that were coming in. Okay? Um, that's how they remained the people. So when the Jews come back, 72 years later-ish, they come back to a land that is inhabited by people of impure blood. These are what we call the Samaritans. Okay? They can trace their line back through to the Jews, but they've intermarried and the, the blood has been diluted. All right? And the Jews came back. Now, the Jew that had his lineage would look down on the Jew that didn't have his lineage, but he could feel pity for him. Because it was not through neglect of their own that they lost these things, but, but they, you know, they couldn't prove who they were. But both of those Jews looked at the Samaritans that had willingly crossed the bloodlines and they looked on them with disgust. And the Samaritans, we know at different points, they were not even allowed to come into the temple, not even to the Gentile court at certain points in the history because of this, this, this hostility that the Jews had for them. How could you give up who you are? If you've ever seen, uh, how many people here have seen the Fiddler on the Roof? Okay. Now you remember the daughter Havila? She married the Russian soldier. Okay? And, and her family disowned her because she was crossing bloodlines with a non-Jew. Okay? So we get a little glimpse of that, but we see how this plays out when Jesus is in his ministry and he's going through Samaria. Now, good Jews, if you remember on your map, you have the Sea of Galilee in the north, and the Jordan comes down and then into the Dead Sea. Off to the northwest of the Dead Sea is Jerusalem. Okay, that's Judea. Well, to the north of there, between the Sea of Galilee and Judea, is Samaria. You go, okay, so what difference does that make? Well, a good Jew would not walk through Samaria. He would go over to the Jordan, cross the Jordan, walk up the, the east side of the Jordan, and then cross into Galilee, so he would not taint himself with being in the presence of Samaritans. Okay, now this is huge. Because twice, Jesus did something that would be absolutely revolting to the Jews. One, he gave a story about a good neighbor. Not State Farm. Okay. He talked about the man that was about his business and he was attacked by the, the thieves. He was beaten. He was left on the side of the road. And the priest comes by. And he looks at him and he, he scoots around him and he goes off about his business. He's a priest. He's got work to do. He's got God work to do. He's got stuff. Important stuff. Holy duties. But then a Levite comes by. A Levite. Now the Levites were the ones that, that helped maintain the temple. Okay, They were not of Aaron's line. So they weren't priests but they were charged with taking care of the, the temple. And so here we have one of the holiest men of Israel walks by and, and goes around his brother. And then we have the, like the second tier of holy man coming by and he does the same. He goes around his brother. And then you have the Samaritan come by. Now we, we don't understand this in our culture because we don't really have a people that we look down on and disdain the way that they did the Samaritans. Okay? But the Samaritan stops. And he ministers to the man, and he puts him on his donkey. He brings him to a hotel. 
and, and puts him in charge of the hotel keeper and says, here, uh, here's money to, to see to his needs, feed him, get medicine, take care of him. If it costs more than that, I'll pay you when I come back through the other way. And, and Jesus says, so who was this man's neighbor? Well, it wasn't the priest, it wasn't the Levite, it was the Samaritan. Now, for Jews hearing this, that's offensive, okay? That's offensive. Then he does another thing, and this one's even greater. Jesus goes into Samaria. Now, that right there is, is going to, some Jews are going to say, all right, you're going to have to go through the, the ritual cleansing because you've sullied yourself by going into this area, as if Jesus needed to be cleansed of anything. But he goes to a town, and, and the disciples, he sends them off into the town to get food to eat. And he's sitting up by a well, and a woman comes to the well, and she draws water. Now, what's interesting about this is not only is Jesus in Samaria amongst people that the Jews, the good Jews, disdain, but he's going to talk to a woman, not of his family, and without any of her family present. And that's something you just did not do. Okay? Um, <clears throat> there was a saying that the Jews had. Said they, they said, thank God that I am not an infidel or a Gentile or a Greek or a dog or a woman. Okay? That, that kind of gives you the idea of what their thinking was. And, and this woman comes up and Jesus says, draw me some water. And she's like, Whoa, 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 whoa. Who are you, a Jew, to ask me, a Samaritan, to draw water? Now, I think this could have gone one of two ways. One, I think she was amazed that, that the Jew would even speak to her. Two, I think she might have been offended. Hey, man, you guys have disdained us all along. What makes you think I'm going to draw water for you? But then Jesus proceeds to engage in conversation, and he reveals things to her that he should not have known. Well, when you're a God, you know stuff. Okay? <laughs> So, so he, he just proved to her that he is transcendent. He is above and beyond her. So this right here, these two things, automatically sets Jesus apart from the traditional Jewish thinking. Okay? So the Samaritans were people frowned on. The, and, and so let's get back to the question. If Jesus had to descend from the line of David, let, let's look at the prophecy first real quick. I'll read, uh, there's a couple of them. First, he's got to come from... Judah, uh, Genesis 49.10 says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Um, he's got to be of the lineage of Jesse. Um, Isaiah 11.1 1 says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. And then, not only that, he's got to come through the lineage of David. Okay, so God, first he chose Israel out of all the people. Well, actually, you go back before that, and, and he chose Shem out of all the three brothers. So one-third of the people, two-thirds have been eliminated right there. Then he comes down to Abraham, and he chooses a specific people unto himself. And so all the rest of the people are eliminated at that point. But then Abraham has two sons. He has Ishmael and, and Isaac. And he says it's going to come through Isaac. So there's half of the family that's, that's removed. And, and then Isaac has two sons, uh, Esau and Jacob. And he says he's going to come through the line of Jacob. So Esau's line is removed. But then he narrows it down even further. And he says, um, this son will come out of the, the tribe of Judah. This Judah is one of the 12 sons of Jacob. But then, not only that, he narrows the field down even more. And he says he's going to come out of the family of Jesse. Okay, Jesse. And, and, but then, Jesse had a lot of kids. One of whom was David. And, and we see later that, that God promises David that from his descendants will come who will sit on a throne who will rule forever. So we see that God has eliminated a lot of people. All right? And he's narrowed the field down. Now the question is, and this is where things, it's an, actually an excellent question. If Jesus was born of the Immaculate Conception, birth of Mary through the Holy Spirit, not of a man, how could he be of the line of David? Because his father is earthly father was not his biological father. Well, in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew, who is a Jew and is writing to Jews, he traces the lineage of Jesus from Abraham down to Joseph, 
and into Jesus. Okay? And right there we go, well, how could this be if, if Joseph was not his father? Well, we'll touch on that in just a minute. Because we have a second genealogy in the book of Luke, who is a Gentile, and he is writing to non-Jews, and he starts with Jesus, and he works his way back up the genealogy, all the way up to uh, Adam. Now, what's interesting about this, if you're into numbers, um, Matthew very clearly breaks up his genealogy into three groups of 14. Okay, and if you read that, he actually mentions that in, in the genealogy. So there were 14 and 14 and 14. Now, what's significant about this, and I'm, I'm not into numerology, but uh, as I was studying this out, I, I came across an interesting tidbit. 14 is the numeric equivalent in the Hebrew language for David. And if you were a Jew, you would know this. Okay, So I think that's why Matthew draws attention to that. Okay. See, he, here he is, his lineage, even the lineage broken down into these three parts of 14 points to David. Now Luke did not. Luke, interestingly enough, I believe Luke broke his lineage down into 11 groups of seven. Now, Luke doesn't say anything about this. He draws no attention to it. But what's interesting is that seven to the Jews is completion. Okay? But also to the Jews... Seven represents the Gentiles. Because when God promised them to come in, that he was giving them Canaan, he told them they had to go in and they had to drive out the seven tribes. And those seven tribes became, came to represent the seven nations of the world. Okay, so that's the Gentiles. So what I think is going on, whether by Luke's knowledge or simply God using him, God is, is telling us it's not just for the Jews, like, I, like I've had Matthew write, but it's also for the Gentiles. He's writing unto us. Okay? Now, there's a discrepancy in these two genealogies. Okay? Immediately, right at the start when you get to Joseph. Um, Matthew's account says that Joseph's father was... Does anybody know? Jacob. Jacob. All right. But Luke says that Joseph's father was Eli or Hila. So right at the start, we've got a, a, a bit of a conundrum. Now, there are two explanations for this. I'm going to share the first one. I don't think the first one is it, but, but it, there is a, an argument to be made. Does anybody know what a leveret marriage is? Or leveret? I've, I've seen it pronounced both ways. In the Old Testament, if a man and a woman were married and he died before he had any offspring, his brother was to come to the woman and with her produce a child that his brother's name would not perish from the earth. It was called a leverate or leverate marriage. Some scholars have said that the difference here is that Jacob was the older brother and he was married and he passed away before he had a child. So Eli coming in, he gives the wife of Jacob a child so that Jacob's line will not end, and that child was Joseph. Okay? Now, th that's possible that that could have happened. All right? We know that that was a, 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 a thing that was still going on because when the Sadducees came to try and trap Jesus, they gave this long, drawn-out problem you know, a man marries a woman and, and he dies without children, so all six of his brothers end up marrying her and, and none of them have children, so at the resurrection, whose husband will she be? Well, Jesus puts them in a place and says, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay, because in heaven there is neither marrying nor giving in marriage. Okay, but we know the idea is there. So this, this is a possibility, the leveret marriage for the discrepancy between the two. However, there's a second explanation that I think is accurate. If you look in Luke chapter 3, when Luke starts his lineage, I'm going to read this, this um, verse to you because I, I want you to note something. So Luke is, has been going through, he's been talking about the miraculous virgin birth, 
he's been talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the angels are coming that speak to the, the shepherds. The shepherds come and they witness the birth. The wise men come later and, and they present their gift. He's talking about this miraculous thing that has happened. But when he gets to um, verse 23, this is right after uh, Jesus' baptism, he, he shifts gears on us. He says, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son as was supposed of Joseph, the son of Helen. That little phrase in there, as was supposed, you know, the Greek's got an incredible, it means as was supposed. That's about as straight a translation as you can get there. I think what Luke is doing is he's drawing our attention to the fact that Joseph was not the father of Jesus. Now we know that at some point in his life, Luke actually encountered Mary, the mother of Jesus. We have historical records that, that indicate that. What I think is happening is I think the story being told here is coming straight from Mary. I think Luke is because we know he was documenting, he was interviewing, he was getting out there asking questions, trying to put everything in order. I think Mary is telling Luke her family lineage. I think that's why there's a discrepancy here, not because Eli is the brother of Jacob, but because Eli is the father of Mary. Okay? And, and we see the lineage going back. Now what's interesting about this, and this is something that you really need to grasp on, throughout the entire ministry and life of Jesus, not one time did anyone question his genealogy. Not once. Okay? Even those who were opposed to him and seeking to entrap him, they never questioned his genealogy. That right there should give you comfort to knowing that God didn't mess up. But if this is the genealogy of Mary, which would make sense because in Matthew's genealogy, he goes all the way back up to David's son. Who did Matthew say Jesus was in the lineage of for David's sons? Solomon. But Luke goes back through, and he comes up to David, and who's, whose son does he have? Nathan. Two different lines, but both of them coming together in King David, thus fulfilling the prophecy that through David's line will come a Messiah who will sit on the throne forever. Okay. Well, you go, well, why didn't he just say Mary? I think there's a couple of reasons, but the, the most important one, I think it's important because the Jews didn't trace genealogy through a woman. And so he just completely circumvented that issue by putting that little phrase in there. Well, some say, you know, supposedly he's the son of Joseph, but here's how it really is. And he goes through and he lists his, his genealogy. Now, really, this is a non-issue. Whether this is Mary or Joseph, and, and whether it's a deliberate marriage or, or, or whatever, it's really a non-issue because legally, Jesus was of the line of David because his father, Joseph, adopted him. So in legal standing, he was entitled to everything that Joseph was. But for those of us that go, okay, but that sounds kind of like a cop-out, that's what I think happened in Luke. I think Luke was talking with Mary because she's given him she's given him all the details. Hey man, this is how it went down. And so he traces it back through. And I think this is important because the Messiah would not have come through David just through mother or father. I think the Messiah had to come through both. And a lot of the Jews thought that as well, that he would come through both. Both sets of parents would be of the line of David. So, all of that to say... <laughs> don't worry about it don't, don't worry about it because God is faithful okay um, Jesus himself actually mentioned him being of himself being of the line of David because he, he asks the Pharisees he says well how can it be that David calls the Messiah his Lord if he's his offspring and, and nobody challenges him nobody questions him about that so, so anyway there you go um, 
I have taken to typing up my answers so that if somebody asks me a question I've already answered, I can just give them the printout. <laughs> All right. Turn. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We've been talking about disciples, discipleship, and we're talking about the fundamentals, that as a disciple of Christ, these are fundamental, these are foundational to your faith, to, to what you profess. Okay, we've talked about um, a number of the things in here, um, I'm, I'm just going to read right now, uh, this is called the Hall of Faith. This goes through example after example after example of men who had men and women who had faith, great faith. So starting in verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, you know what? i got to back up even further because I'm already into faith and, and I haven't... Um, I haven't laid the groundwork. Uh, back up to chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. I'm getting ahead of myself. Starting in verse 1. Um, we've already gone over this before. Really, you need to back up into chapter 5. When the author wrote, he did not write chapter and verse. So, where we insert those things so it's easy for you and I to get to the same place in the writings. The author did not put them there. And oftentimes, these breaks are not in good places. Okay? Especially when a, a chapter starts off with therefore. What, there's got to be a reason that's there. And that reason is in the previous chapter. So, you need to back up into 5 and, and read the tale into 5. But we're going to start in chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore... Let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instructions about washings and laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Now, the author of Hebrews, is he's actually at kind of a point in his letter where he's kind of frustrated with the audience, with the readers. He's frustrated because they should be more mature in their faith than they are. And he wants to explain to them the deep things of God, but he, he tells them, you're, you're too shallow right now. You're like babes. And, and you need milk, but you've got to get to the point where you can eat meat. And, and so what he's saying is, these are the foundational things. You've got to get these so that we can move on. So when we start talking about doctrine, when we start talking about our beliefs, we start here. Okay? Because these are the things that are fundamental to the Christian faith. So a couple of weeks ago, we talked about uh, repentance. And, and we talked about how repentance is, is a changing of your mind. You, you turn away from what you were thinking before and you have new thinking. And that carries through in the revelation of sin. You, you turn from your sin unto righteousness. Okay, that's, that's repentance. Repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry. That's apologizing. One of the things that used to drive me nuts about Christy, when we would argue, she would get tired and she would say, okay, you're right, I'm sorry. I knew she didn't believe I was right. <laughs> she just wanted me because now she's repented, she's apologized, now i got to forgive her. <laughs> and the argument has to be done. <laughs> I conceded defeat so many times because she would do that. <laughs> okay? So, repentance is having a change of thought. And as a result of that change of thinking, that permeates out through your actions. Now, we move into faith, and it says a faith toward God. Now, last week we talked about faith. 
But there are a couple of things I didn't get time to address, and I, I want to wrap those up today, okay? Because we talked about what faith is. The, the Greek word for faith is pistis, okay? And, and it means to believe, to have trust in. And we, we looked at, at Merriam Webster and, and how the, the Americans view faith, and, and oftentimes it's associated with religion. Um, okay, I, I can accept that. Because if you're going to be religious about something, you're only religious about it because you believe it. Okay? But, but I want to talk today a little bit about what faith isn't. Now, my goal here today is not to bash anyone or anything. My goal is to set truth before you. Okay? So, if I say something that, that causes you to go, whoa, don't, don't be offended. Come talk to me so we can clarify, all right? Because I grew up in the faith movement, meaning physically. I, I went from, you know, like 9 or 10 up till I was in college, and, and even in college, I was part of the, the Word of Faith movement, okay? And I, I've told the story how when we lived here the first time, um, you know, fresh out of college, uh, I've got all the answers because I took all the classes. I mean, I, I went to Bible school to learn etiquette. So when I come to your house, I should be using the proper fork in the proper order. I didn't like that class. In my house, we had one fork and you used it for everything. Okay? And if your fork disappeared, you just grab the person next to you. And you notice. Um, but I want to talk about what faith isn't. Faith is not unto itself. You go, well, what, what, what does that mean? What it means is that faith has to have an object. A person or a thing that you are placing your faith in. Now, growing up as I did, when, when God confronted Christy and I, after we'd gotten out of Bible school and we were ministering, and, and, and he challenged us, he says, why do you believe what you believe? And, and we said, well, I mean, that's what we've been taught. I mean, we, we went all through growing up in, in the church and, and Bible school, and, and I've got the documents to show you that I learned it and you know and, and he says well what does my word say well I can give you all of the scriptures that support what I believe but he says what does the totality of my word say oh uh oh <laughs> so we went through a period of actually more than a year it was actually up in a couple years where we had to go back and we had to go right back to the roots of our faith and we had to look at everything that we believed and see how it lined up with the totality of scripture. And, and I gotta tell you, we had a lot of people that had problems with some of the things that we had to change in our lives because we could not see that principle in scripture. And so God was calling us. Uh, we actually were kicked out of a church because of what we believed and, and the changes that God was bringing about in us. Um, because people are, they, they want to believe what they believe. And they don't want you to shake that tree. Alright? Uh, you, you guys remember Yertle the turtle? And he climbed all the way up on the top of all the other turtles and he wanted to be the highest of the height. And I don't even remember the poor little turtle on the bottom, but he had enough and down the whole thing came. Okay, so I might be like the turtle on the bottom today. I'm going to shake your tree. Okay? Um, faith is not unto itself. You can't have faith in faith. It's not a magical, mystical force. Okay? Faith is unto something. In the Christian faith, our faith is unto God, as revealed in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, there was this idea that was being taught back in the 80s and the 90s, that, that somehow or another God was manipulated and subject to the force of faith. I gotta tell you folks, that's not a scriptural principle. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. 
It's, he's not going to be jerked off his throne because you exert a tremendous amount of faith. <laughs> he's not going to be going, hey, this is the way I'm going. And, oh, okay. Susie Dooley is exhibiting amount of faith. I've got to change my direction. All my plans. That it doesn't work that way. Now, this is not to say that faith does not move God. Just like I believe prayer moves God. But it doesn't change his mind. It doesn't alter his plans. His word says that when I speak, it will be done. Who can sway me? Who can turn me? Who can prevent it from happening? No one. Okay? So, while we have faith and we stand on the promises of, of God, we have faith in a sovereign God. Yes. Not a genie. Not a butler. Not a mom, not a dad that you can manipulate. But a sovereign God that knows everything. I grew up learning that there were only three answers to prayer. In its simplest form, there were only three answers to prayer. Yes, no, and not yet. Okay? I don't believe that anymore. I, I, I really don't. I believe that God gives us two answers. Yes, but most often, I've got something better. I've got something better. Okay? Uh, I tell people, you know, I don't believe that there is one person out there in the world for you until you say, I do. Once you say, I do, there's only one person out there in the world for you. Okay? Now, God knows all things, and He knows who you're going to pick. He knows who you're going to go with. But, but I don't think God forces you that way. I, I honestly don't. But the moment you say, I do, and that covenant is made before God, guess what? There's only one person. Okay? So, faith is not unto itself. It has to look to something beyond itself, something above itself. It is not a power, but an exercise. Okay? It's not like you have this well, um, this, this, this magic pouch, and, and okay, well, you need something, so you take out a little bit of faith out and you sprinkle it, you know, like the pixie dust, and then you can fly. That, that's not how it works. It is an exercise in believing. But believing what? Now see, this is where we get into trouble. In America, because we have it so easy, because we are incredibly, fantastically wealthy, beyond the norm of the world, beyond the average of the world, we really don't get challenged a lot in our faith. I was, uh, there's, there's a song that we actually sing at this church. Um, oh, come on. It is well, sweetie. What's the name of the song? Through it all. Through it all. I, I love the song. Um, you know, through it all, it is well. Um, but I, I, I made the mistake of reading the background of the song. And, and this, this woman that was writing it, uh, she and her husband were trying to buy a house. And it didn't look like they were going to get the house. And she was praying and she was depressed and she was upset. And, and then God birthed this song out of that. And, and, you know, through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well with my soul. And I'm thinking... Okay, when Horatio Spafford wrote It Is Well With My Soul, he was crossing the Atlantic, and he was in the vicinity that his wife and his, his daughters were shipwrecked, and, and he lost all of his daughters, all three of them. And he crossed that section of the ocean, and he sat down, and he wrote the lyrics to It Is Well. Now, I compare the two, and I don't mean to diminish. They, they were probably struggling. I mean, they, they had their hopes on this house. They really wanted it to go through. And, and God was teaching her to, to wait on him, and that regardless whether they got the house or not, it is well. But when you hold that trial, in light of some of the things that we saw in the movie last night, and in light of Horatio Spafford's uh, moving... Uh, penmanship, uh, moving writing concerning the loss of his daughters. Uh, I think sometimes we, we really were pampered. 
we're babied. And, and we, we tend to be more like those that want milk than those that want meat. And so um, I want to, to share with you um, that the, the faith is not like a magic dust that you can throw and get things done. Uh, faith is not blind. You go, whoa, 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 pastor. I got a scripture that says otherwise. <sighs> Uh-oh, you caught me. No, you didn't. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5 8. Flip there with me if you would, real quick. Because this is something we need to look at to have a better understanding. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. I might have written that wrong, down wrong. Oh, because I'm in 1 Corinthians. I'm backing up to verse 6. Um, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. This is uh, a follow-up letter to previous letters he had written. Uh, so he says in verse 6, So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Now, Verse 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. So people take that and they equal that means faith must be blind. That's not at all what Paul is saying here. As a matter of fact, the Greek word that that pistis is drawn from is pisteo. And that means to be convinced, to be persuaded. See, faith is not blind. It trusts in things that we cannot see, but it trusts in them with good reason. Okay? So Paul is writing this and he says, um, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Now let's look at that in the context of what he's actually writing. He's talking about our heavenly home versus the physical dwelling that we now have. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. We don't hope that it might be. We're hoping that that day will come when we will receive it. We don't go, oh gosh, I really hope I'm going to make it into heaven. Look, Scripture makes it very clear. You believe in Christ, you profess Him as Lord, you're saved. Okay? So, so that part is what's required. Um, I put a slide on the desk desktop there. Would you open it up and put it up for me, please? So what, what Paul is talking about here, he says, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, in this fleshly dwelling, we are away from God. We are, we're separated from the manifest presence of God on the throne in heaven by time and space while we're here on this earth. Now his spirit is amongst us. God is spirit, so we know He's here with us, but we can't see Him. So He says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 8, Yes, we are of good courage. And, and this is one of those things that we as Christians have got to walk on. And we've got to get rooted deep in our psyche, in our soul, in our understanding. Because what He says here, most of us don't agree with. If we're honest, most of us would, would not agree with this. He says, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. <clears throat> I, I tell you folks, I cannot wait for that day. Now there was a time when I wanted to bargain with God and, okay, God, you can come back, but can I do this first? <laughs> let me just get to this point in my life and then it's okay. You know, let me advance so far and then before things get bad, come get me. Okay, but but quite honestly, I, I man, that is my my great hope today is man, I would love for him to come get me. Okay, and until we get that 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 God is the single most important thing there is, period, and we should not want anything above Him. We're still milk drinkers. Okay, what is our formula? I put it up here so you guys can see. 
This is our formula. This is what Paul presents to us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Now, we're talking about faith, okay? But, but knitted together with faith is grace. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Okay, what, what that is, is, is God giving to you something not earned. Because you can't earn it. You, you can't work your way into the kingdom. What really can you do that's going to impress God? I mean, really. Monks living up in the monastery are no nearer to God than you are right here. They probably have less noise competing. But but quite honestly, man, I think that's why Jesus says, hey, separate yourself off. Go into your prayer closet and pray. Don't get away from the distractions. Man, when I'm sitting on my corner of the deck or I'm sitting in my red chair, everybody in the family knows, don't bother Dad. Okay? <clears throat> We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So faith, to be convinced of. Faith isn't blind. If it were blind, we wouldn't have all of this. All we would have is a little track that says, believe in God. And that would be enough. But God did not choose to do it that way. He chose to gave us, give us verifiable proofs. You go verifiable. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there that you can't verify. There's a lot of stuff in here we can. And more and more and more is being discovered day by day by day. Okay? So, our formula, as Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, grace, God's giving us what we do not deserve. Faith, even that is something that God gives us because in and of ourselves, we don't have the power to believe. So faith equals salvation. That's it, folks. We don't need to complicate it further than that. But then it doesn't end there, does it? Because in verse 10, Paul tells us that, that we are created to do good works. See, see, the works are an outgrowth of our faith. They're a birthing out of, of being convinced um, historically in the church, there have been three terms used to define faith. Um, I'll just give them to you here very quickly uh, because there's some things that we need to move on to. Um, three things required for faith. One, knowledge. In Latin, it's noticia. Knowledge. You've got to know what you're believing in. If you didn't know God, how could you believe in Him? If you didn't know about God, how could you believe in Him? If you had never heard of the name Jesus, how could you have faith in Him? So there is a, a level of knowledge that is required unto salvation, but knowledge itself isn't enough, is it? Is it? Well, even the demons believe and shudder. Now, there are a lot of atheists out there that believe Jesus was a real person. Okay? But then there's a second ingredient. There's a second key here. It's assent. Assent. Agreement. So it, it, it's not just having the knowledge, but in some manner, your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, has got to come into agreement with what you know. And, and sometimes that's hard because there are evidences that would, would present themselves to you and say, see, this can't be so. But God says it is. And so I've got to choose. Well, I have this knowledge and I have this knowledge. Which one am I giving assent to? Am I going to trust God or am I going to trust those other things? <clears throat> May God be true and every man a liar. Mm -hmm. Okay? But, but even that is not enough. Because you can agree, yeah, Jesus was a man and, and He did good things and, and He gives a, you know, that's a good way to live. But, but you, you're, you're still lacking something. By the way, if you were writing down the Latin word, ascent is a census. The final one is fiducia. Trust. 
Trust. Trust. How do you know you trust someone? How do you know you trust someone? Isla, come here. See her arms? Yes. What is she expecting? Is she trusting me? Yes. She has her arms up. She trusts that when she comes to Papa with her arms up, he's going to pick her up and he's going to hold her. He's not going to, I'm not going to trip her. I'm not going to turn my back on her. I'm, I'm going to respond. How does she know this? Because that's what always happens every time. Now there may be a moment when I'm not paying attention when she comes up, I'm talking to someone and she comes up with her arms up and I'm, I'm, I'm preoccupied doing something, but as soon as I know, I pick her up. Now, now with God, that isn't even a good illustration because God always knows. Did, did, are you aware that God always has His attention on you, undivided attention on you? That's part of what makes Him an infinite transcendent being, is He can pay 100% attention to you and at the same time pay 100% attention to me. I don't know how that works. I'm a man. I don't multitask. Okay? I, I do one thing at a time. And, and everybody in my family knows, if you don't have my focus, I didn't hear you. The rule is, I have to look at you and respond intelligibly. Otherwise, it didn't happen. Okay? Because the, the rule used to be, I have to look at you. But there were times when they would, I would look at them, but my eyes would be kind of glazed over, still pondering whatever I was reading. And they would say something, and I'd, I'd be like, ugh. You know? And they'd go and do it. And then I'd walk out, and I'd be like, what the heck are you doing? Who said you could do that? You did. No, I didn't. I would never tell you. Dad, I told him. Okay, well, look, was I looking at you? Yes, you were. Did I respond intelligibly? Okay. Trust. You have to trust that what you know and what you agree is so. Trust. This is what faith is made of. It's not being able to cast magic powers to manipulate God. It's not some cosmic force that, that moves the heavenly winds. It is that relationship where God has proven himself over and over and over again, not just in his word, but also in your life. Not, now keep in mind, God doesn't move according to our timetable. There's a lot of times, I've, there's things I'm still praying for today that I've been praying for for years. God has said that he will do certain things. We can call him out on that. I, I think of David, reading through the Psalms. Look how many times... The, the, that David challenges God and says, God, you have promised me this. Bring it to pass. Let it be. May it be. If David, who is a man after God's own heart, could challenge God according to the promises that God had given him, maybe we need to exert a little more confidence according to the promises that he's given us. Maybe we can trust Him. Okay? So, we've talked about repentance from dead works. We've talked about faith in God, not faith unto itself, not faith unto our, our doctrine or our dogma, but faith in God. One of the things in the movie last night that uh, I was talking with Joan afterwards, we were looking at the persecution of the Christians in the Middle East. And what's funny is a lot of Christians today... And, and the circles that we dwell would not consider some of them to be Christians because of their peculiarities of their faith. They don't have the same doctrine or dogma that we do. But what is required unto salvation? God's grace, the faith that He gives us, is required unto salvation. Now, if they want to dress up in a robe and they want to do uh, things in other languages and, and they have a particular form of worship that they do, it's not for me to say they're not saved. So, next week, we're going to look at the next in the foundations of our faith. 
baptism, or actually in some translations, it's, it's ceremonial washings. We're going to take a look at that. We're going to go into depth. Now, these are things that you have got to get rooted at the base of your faith because God says these are foundational doctrines. These are foundational principles for our understanding of how things work. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you today and we thank you because you are the Almighty. God, you are loving. You are kind. Father, you are also just. As a matter of fact, your word tells us that if we confess our sins, you are just to forgive us our sins. Because the price has been paid. It has all been paid at the cross. I thank you, Father, that you have not left us alone, but you've sent your Holy Spirit to teach us, to lead us, to guide us, to convict us, to help us, Father, in this daily walk. I ask, Lord God, that you would birth in us a hunger to know you more, a thirsting for righteousness. Father, that we would be a people that are so confident in you that we would go where you would send us, that we would do as you would ask of us. We would do so with boldness, with joy, with love. And I ask, Father, that you would help us to be bright lights in a dark world. We bless you today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.